besides. Thank you guys for attending. This is Intermediate Physical Security with Justin Wen. He's a, a senior security consultant with Coal Fire Systems, has performed uh, multiple red team and physical engagements and a variety on a variety of facilities including hospitals, banks, and critical infrastructure, and many more. Cool. So without further ado, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Yep, that all sounds right. Uh, my name is Justin Wynn. Thank you, thank you. And thank you guys for trusting me with your time. This is actually my first time speaking to the public like this, so hopefully I don't suck, but we're gonna find out together, right? Um, I fortunately did spend a lot of time in this slide, doc. We, uh, slide deck. We got a lot of slides to cover, but the material here is good. The speaker may be in between, but we're gonna get through it together. Um, so jumping right in, I wanna let you know we are skipping lock picking 101, so we're going beyond that, what bypasses are out there. Um, and going over a little bit of terminology and anatomy of locks real quick and laws, and then jumping right into it bypass after bypass. So hopefully it's a fun talk. All right, so this should look a little bit familiar to a lot of people here. Um, again, skipping this, but we need to know the components because we're going to be talking about other things so besides the pin stacks here. Um, I did just want to get the juices flowing, though, cover a couple things. This is the Bible up here. This holds six pin columns. Inside each pin column, there are pin stacks, and we have six of those. On the top, we have the spring, then the driver pin, key pin. Um, this is a key in here, and it says it's a 999 key diagram. This is wrong. A 999 key is actually a bump key, which which means all the bits are driven down to the ninth position, uh, the lowest space that they'll go to. Uh, and I think that's all I wanted to cover there. Click, click, click. The end. <laughs> really? Harder. Stop it. Is it clicking Yeah, how does it go like right until I start talking? Like it was good like two minutes ago? It's actually on. It was. It got me through the first slide. That was very helpful. Oh, but you said you changed the battery in the lavalier? Yeah. Um, hey, looks at me. Look at you. You're magic. Okay. Um, so moving on, this is actually another terrible diagram. Uh, I did want to call out a couple things here, though. We have an auxiliary dead latch, which is the piece in the middle. Uh, when the door closes, this is actually meant to depress against the strike plate. Everything else kind of extends into the strike cavities, so the dead bolt and the latch bolt is actually what keeps the door shut within the frame. Um, and the auxiliary dead latch, when that's depressed and it's closed, prevents the latch bolt from retracting again, so it locks it out in place, much like a dead bolt. Uh, in a padlock, there was a couple of terminology pieces I wanted to cover here. Mostly the rear, uh, the plug rear protection plate. Uh, so this prevents any tools from slipping beyond the authentic mechanism, which is the plug, uh, so you can't put a tool beyond that and start manipulating latches. Um, unfortunately, not all padlocks have these, and there is a bypass associated, which we'll cover. So laws, real quick, before we get into the fun stuff, this is an awesome diagram by Tool, the open organization of lock pickers, and they kind of cover and watch our backs as far as what's legal and what's not. So pretty much everything is fair game until you start getting into some states here listed in uh, yellow, like Nevada covers us or is especially applicable because we go to DEF CON and uh, Black Hat out there in Vegas. Um, the only thing we really need to know about Nevada is that they enforce uh, prima facie, which is essentially you are guilty until proven innocent. So so if they come across you, you have picks or something, and you're in a suspicious situation, you're guilty, you need to start talking your way out of it, prevent, uh, present authorization, you know this is a card, or if you have a get out of jail free letter, um, but it's not the place to be just carrying picks on you uh, ruthlessly, um, like I always do. So TSA out there loves me. Anytime I go through and they're like, hey, you know, picks are restricted out here, and say actually they're not. We have prima facie in Nevada, and it basically means uh, I can have this and I'm a security consultant, and I'm not uh, committing a crime right now. Um, it's pretty apparent and readily evident. Uh, after that point, you can politely remind them they're also not law enforcement and proceed with your day. <laughs> the only thing I also want to cover here is Tennessee is a bad state for any case. Don't go there with anything. Um, there, there's a lot of restrictions you can get through with some stuff. You need a lock, uh, locksmith license, so it's just really restricted. That would be kind of the biggest thing I want to point out to you guys. It's a dangerous state when it comes to this stuff. So padlock shims, um, one of the easiest bypasses out there. i got a great video that I'll show you, but this is kind of how they work, where they insert uh, and what they look like and surprisingly I found a very helpful video by Masterlock which is one of the only good things they've probably done for this industry um, but they have an excellent video on two techniques so you can go in the opposite side of the shackle and start circling around and that'll retract the latch opening up the shackle shimming technique one and what they're calling top-down shimming. 
So if you have the beveled latch, you can slip down with that, retract that latch manually. Again, same thing. There's nothing locking the, the uh, shackle in place here. Shackle pops right open. So thank you, Master Lock. First time I can ever say that. Um, so shims are a little difficult to carry. So I did uh, make a 3D printed design. Uh, it's open source. It's out there on my GitHub. You can download this, and it's a great way to carry a couple common tools that I use, including two Bogotas, which are excellent lock picks that pretty much get through everything. Um, carries six shims, and they usually come in different sizes. So we have uh, small, medium, large. And then I have two bypass tools here. One is a quick stick, and the other one is a uh, bypass tool for a master lock 175. Yes, sir. Can you say the metal that three times three? Padlock shims, padlock shims, padlock shims. Six, I'm, six, six lock shim sheet. Oh, yeah, no, alliteration's gonna kick me in the ass one day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, stupid name, but that is what it is, and it's on the internet forever now. Okay, um, so I also want to show you another cool way that you can carry padlock shims with you. These things are really difficult. If you have a bunch in your pocket, like I promise, they will go flying the second you reach for your tools. Um, so you can carry a flat sheet of metal about two by one, cut out in the shape of an M like this. Slips right in your wallet, you always have this. Now from here, we can start folding this up and make shims on the fly. So you can always have something ready to go instead of carrying these uh, obtrusive pieces in your pocket. So I also want to show you a remediation for this. Uh, the proper padlocks use ball bearings, and from here it looks like a crescent moon piece in the middle that's called the cam. So when the key goes in, rotates the cam, that crescent moon shape aligns with the ball bearings, allowing the ball bearings to come in, shackle can pop open. Um, so with this mechanism, there's no way to shim. If you try going in here, you hit that ball bearing, there's nowhere for that to move, so mechanically secure. All right, I also want to show you an American bypass. I got a great video here. Uh, he fumbles a little bit trying to demonstrate this because he's holding on to multiple pieces and inserting a tool, but let's bear with them. This is a vulnerability due to uh, the lack of that rear plug protection plate. It allows tools to slip beyond the authentication mechanism, the plug, and actually reach the internals of the lock. But if you can see what he's doing, he has a bypass driver there that looks a lot like a golf club. And it reaches back, hits the cam, and then it can mechanically actuate that without needing the key because there's no piece blocking that from reaching the sensitive parts of the lock. Here's a live video of what it actually looks like. So the flag of the bypass driver, the little tip at the end, goes away from the keys on American 700s and 1100s, which is where this uh, bypass is applicable to. Uh, many other locks are also vulnerable to this. Uh, some Abuses are as well. But this is a very ubiquitous lock. You will see this everywhere once you start recognizing these model numbers, but the 700 and 1100. Pretty simple. And he's putting a lot of tension there, so these tools, they don't last forever, they will break over time. One way to get a little bit more lifetime out of your tool is to take the pressure off the back of that cam by depressing the shackle, freeze things up a little bit internally so the tool works a little bit better and easier. So American, they thought to themselves, and these, these are good people, these are a good company. Unlike Masterlock, they, they're kind of just awful. It's really frustrating. Um, but American does things right. They include security pins. They actually care about security. It's meant to be a decent lock. But they came out and they're like, wow, like looking at this from a business standpoint, we have so many of these locks out here in the field. We can't offer to replace all these. Like We're kind of screwed. Until one of their internal guys said, you know what, I can fix this for about two cents. And they installed that rear plug plate, at, uh, retro retroactively fitted it into the locks. So this is a video and you can see how this would apply to the back of the uh, the plug. And you can see it has the same shape as the back of the core. And it fits on there just like that. So when that's in place, we get the other part of the mechanism up here. So, super simple, and you can kind of visualize. The tool's not going to be allowed back in there, right? Wrong. Because we're hackers and we're cheeky. So somebody else came along, a troll, and he had a little piece of metal and a hammer. And you can kind of imagine how these work. You put that to the back of the keyway, tap on it, break through. Um, and I do have a video of this. It eats up a little bit of time, so I'm just going to breeze through it. But it's pretty much what you see is what you get. Put that in there, hammer it through, and eventually you create that space for your bypass tool to come back and work. All right, so this is the silver bullet bypass. Um, kind of, again, awkward and obtuse shaped tools that I don't typically carry with me, especially because they're only applicable to master lock levels one through four. Five and six are also um, semi-vulnerable to this attack, but basically what they're doing in, they, you stick the two tools in to the bottom of the lock, you'll grab onto the latches from either side and then kind of scissor, and it retracts the latches, opens this up on master lock one through four. Wow. <laughs> 
that looks really easy. Getting those in place is kind of a bitch. Like it takes a while. Um, also on five and six, this will partially retract those to the point where shimming now comes back into play. So five and six are not vulnerable to shimming uh, until you do this and then you can pop that open. But fortunately they're master locks. One through six are pretty easy picks if you have a rake in 30 seconds. So I want to show you the slowest animation I could find on an overlifting attack. This is also called combing. Uh, a vulnerability exists. You know, you have your shear line in between those pins, but what happens if you can lift everything up? So if the lock body is too large, you can go ahead and bypass all the pins, push everything up, create a second shear line below everything, and then rotate the plug. So tools and locks that this actually works on, the Master Lock 141D <clears throat> is vulnerable and that's something you'll see out there all the time. Um, and pretty much just get a feel for it because you'll come across things that are clones or Chinese knockoffs, like you'll see stuff out there. If you see something that has a wide body and it looks like it might be vulnerable, give a comb a shot because odds are it will. Uh, training Lock, it's a seven pin that they have. They have both of these over there in the lock picking village, so I'd recommend go give it a shot and ask if anybody has some combs around. And you, yeah, yeah, and you can see, you can see how this attack works and super quick. Um, it's like using the key, honestly. So the Master Lock 175 Bypass. This is the most ubiquitous combo wheel lock in America. You will see this on critical infrastructure. Um, governments are very fond of them, so are state municipalities, um, and super bypassable. So you have the typical M175 and then all of its cousins. You have long shackles, the protected shackles, weather resistant versions. All of them are vulnerable to this bypass here. Um, this is a cutaway version of this lock to let you know kind of what's going on in between, but there's essentially a, a shackle inside that pivots or a little lever. Um, so if you can get in there and lift one side up, shackle will pop right open as we'll see. How these things operate is pretty simple. If you take the pressure, push in on the shackle, take the pressure off, this lever here just lifts up and that's all that's holding this in place. All right? So super quick and easy if the lock is cut open like that. Um, if, it's, if it's not and you come across a real lock, uh, there's this little tool that again fits in that six shim sheath. Yeah, I can't even do it once. Um, and how this tool works is very thin piece of sheet metal uh, that goes in between the second and third wheel, typically on the left. Um, this is pretty much the spot everyone goes to. You can also use the second wheel in between, but the further inside uh, aligned with the lever, the better. Um, so that'll go in there. It has a bladed edge. So that helps go over those wheels because, of course, there's an ax uh, axle here uh, that you have to get over. And then from there, you can either push up with this and try to pivot, but typically I push down, lifting the back of that and it'll open right up. Um, some of the older versions before they realized this vulnerability were a little bit looser with their tolerances. You can also stick some hook picks back in there and if you can get wedge that behind the, uh, the wheel, it'll pop open too. Um, it does leave some evidence that this lock has been bypassed. You can typically come up to these and see if anybody has bypassed it with a, with a pick before because this metal here will start warping and over time just gets easier and easier to bypass. So one of the cornerstones of my talk are key to like systems, AKA common keys. Um, this, this is a system that's just pretty much out there everywhere for a lot of reasons. Um, it basically means one key will open many locks. And they do this for things like elevators and hotels, fire service has to be able to come in here and access that elevator if things are shut down or open it back up, disable things. Um, and this applies to everything. So I wanted to show you two of the most common keys we have are the CH751 and the C415A. These are way for locks that will work on so much stuff that they shouldn't. So you'll see it on ATMs, um, pretty much every RV is keyed to a CH751, the little containers underneath. Same deal with the lock beds in the back of trucks. You'll see it on um, voting machines, uh, vehicles. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, even uh, elevators actually. At our office in Colorado, um, we're also vulnerable to this. Uh, fortunately, that's not our system, but word has it that these do operate the elevator there. <laughs> Uh, I listed a couple here. Um, I'd actually recommend go see uh, Deviant Olive um, and some of his talks, and he has an entire talk in common keys, and he carries a couple pounds worth of keys. Um, and some of the guys that he, he works with are just phenomenal. So I listed a couple, um, some interesting things that I've seen. It almost becomes a game, you know, carry around your couple common keys in your key set and find out where these work, and then go report back on Twitter, and we'll all have a laugh. Um, so how can this be applied to physical penetration testing? Uh, it's been increasingly common on recent engagements that I've been on. The client doesn't want us to use lock picking because anybody can pick a lock. So they want to see what else can you do? And, you know, if we take this out of sto scope, like really trying to tie our hands behind our back, we're secure, can you get in without that? Um, so some systems, like we'll go in with keys and that's not picking the lock. We have the key for your lock and it's great, great to be able to demonstrate that to the client. Um, so some systems that we'll see this on are telephony based access control based systems 
systems. Um, this is like at a, um, you'll commonly see this at uh, apartments. You go up, you have to dial your friend's number, calls them, they press the button, beep, and it lets you in, you know? Um, these are emergency exit um, alarms. So the, the actual mechanism to turn it on and off is not a common key. Uh, they randomize those, but the top ones are for the battery cover. So take the battery cover off, unlock it, and <laughs> go right out. Uh, this is a key box. I, I'm still not sure if I've seen one of these that is secure. Like typically you can wiggle these open. Um, and again, it's usually wafer locks, so stick a paper clip in there and it falls open as well. But typically also key to uh, one of the common uh, wafer, lock, or wafer keys. So I also wanted to discuss construction cores. Um, this is a very visible uh, indicator that this key or this uh, lock has a common key available for it. Construction cores are used when they're building a facility. They'll go through, key everything with these green cores, and then all the construction workers have these keys. And then afterwards you know, visually inspect, okay, this is one of the keys that needs to be switched out, great. A lot of times this still exists. People will take them home. They install them out of their things. I mean, very cheap and easy to buy since they're so available. Um, so a system that has as a common key, and of course you can see over here, I, I didn't do good enough work um, capturing all the resources where I pulled all this information from. Fortunately, this one I got somebody's Twitter picture in there too, so they get credit. Um, but a lot of this is just an amalgamation of other, other talks that I'm giving you. So one interesting thing about these systems, that construction core, this green guy here, you'll see it almost has like two um, like plugs in it. And it's, it's actually one, it's called a small format interchangeable core or an LFIC large format. Um, but they both work the same way. They have a sleeve and then the typical plug. So there's actually two shear lines with these. And associated with that are two keys. So you have a control key and an operating key. Operating key is what the user has. So in your apartment, you may have this. You go up and that's the key that you use. Unlocks things as normal. Water break. And the control key is how they can swap these in and out. So that's the purpose of these. They can fit right in the lock. You don't need any tools. Take the other key, retract. If you see this sleeve has a protrusion on it, if you have the right key that operates up to the second shear line, you can retract that back. The entire lock comes out. So I want to show you this because it's quite common too to come across locks that don't have one installed, if you don't believe me. Again, uh, <laughs> the offices that we have out in Colorado, somebody else's floor, they had the, the core missing inside that plug. And Inside the, uh, the lock body there. So um, inside that, you'll usually have the mechanism still protruding that operates that lock. So we've taken away the authentication. Now we have the cam mechanism behind that you can still operate manually. You can do this with, with pliers or a screwdriver. It's really difficult, actually. So that's the tool that you can use to operate these. Um, it looks like a little tuning fork in there, and it's just surprisingly difficult to grab with a lot of tools. So I recommend something like that. And then any lock body that you come up to that doesn't have its core, no authentication, walk up, just turn it with a tool, and it'll unlock right open. So this is Deviant, great guy in the industry. Um, he's, he's one of the pioneers and thought leaders. Would definitely recommend following him on YouTube, Twitter, all the things. And he's working with a telephony-based access control system. Um, I'll annotate because he, uh, you know, we don't have great video or audio here. Dorking system, it's got a mail key on the outside, so if you deliver a package, uh, UPS has, has the key to be able to unlock this. He's actually got the 16120 key for a Dorking system. And the rest is pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Um, so you'll see the placeholder. This is a linear system, uh, now rebranded as Nortec. They still say linear on all the boxes you'll see out there. And then DKS, Door King System. Uh, linear works with the A126 key, DKS is the 16120. And both, both of these models here are fitted for, I believe it's called the Escuchion key, um, where you'll have, you know, mail can come up and they have that secondary access for the arrow key that comes in that UPS carry, or USPS carries and gets you in everywhere. Um, and behind that, they'll have a momentary switch. So when you turn that, it, it clicks the, the relay and opens right up. If it doesn't have that installed, you've got to work a little bit harder for it. Open up the case and there'll be a set of relays here where they wire everything into. You take a clip and you have to relay those two together or bridge that connection. And and then that'll, that'll operate in the same way and open it right up. Um, same deal with DKS. Uh, so some of these are alarmed. Um, right in here, they will have um, a magnetic sensor, understands when the door op is open um, without a key, or even with a key, and it'll send out an alarm. Um, and then I, oh, actually, it's, sorry, one slide too early. Um, 
the default codes in these. Pretty much every linear system, or about half of them that I come across, still have the default administrator code, which is one, two, three, four, five, six. So I wanted to show you a video by Dennis Maldonado, who has just read the manual and goes through, and he's gotten this down really quick. This is less than 10 seconds. Goes into the admin menu, uh, selects, I want to add a new user, and then he plugs in his own code, exits the admin menu, and then logs right back in. Admin code, add a user, user code one, repeat, exit the menu, and then use the code that he just entered. Access granted. Okay, um, also something that I worked on, I have a really shitty 3D printer, it was 300 bucks, and I finally got it to the point uh, where I can make keys with it. And the linear key, the A126, is really tiny, uh, but that's also out there on my GitHub. Uh, I need to work on the 16120 and do this with all the keys, it would be really cool um, when I have time. But this is out there and available, so if you guys, you, know, you can buy these keys anywhere to eBay, Amazon, whatever, um, or go to the vendor site, so you lost the key and they'll ship you a new one, um, or print your own. Just curious, with the PLA strong enough for that, or do you have to use it? Uh, no, no, PLA actually works. It's finicky, but do 100% fill. Um, I did want to make models where you can stick a tension wrench in there too, so like raise all the pins with the, with the 3D printed model and then use the tension wrench to apply the tension. Uh, but he's concerned that you know, because this is so thin, uh, especially right where the blade begins, a lot of these can snap off, damage a lock, uh, filament can fray a little bit too, so it's not great on the locks. Um, but again, never, never lock pick on something that you don't have permission for, um, and you should be good. But there, there are concerns with, with using 3D printed keys. Sorry? Metal printer, yeah, yeah, money. <laughs> Donate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Which would be great, like someday, absolutely. Um, so I wanted to show you the tamper evidence switch that they have in here. Um, it's that little relay inside, but it can be bypassed. So on the computer screen, it's a little small, it does say the door's open. Okay, great, now he's closed it, and it's read both of those uh, operations. Now he's taking a neodymium magnet, and smart guy, he has a glove, because he's probably learned a lesson like I have. Uh, those things have a lot of force, it's like 60 to like 100 pounds of force. Uh, so what I recommend is, like, if you carry this around with you in your gear, like when we have computers, so it's concerned, right? Um, but even just all the metal you'll take with you on an engagement, like this thing's just a pain in the butt. Put it in a sock is one of the great ways to still get most of that force and then have a really easy way to pull it back off. Um, otherwise, you can really be in a bind and be sitting there for a minute with a 100 pound fixture attached to it. Um, so what he showed there, attached it, and he was opening and closing again, and no, no log reported of that. So magnets are pretty cool. I want to show you a hype video by Sparrows that applies to the simplex Kava push button lock. Um, so this mechanism, push your code, and that, that works things uh, properly inside to uh, connect the actuator, but you can bypass that using the magnets. Yeah, baby. <laughs> so he joked, you'll see this at the office bathroom. This is in use in a lot of places where uh, it's meant to be a more secure facility. Airports, you'll see this all over the place, big offices, um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, unfortunately, well fortunately, they, they did remediate this vulnerability at some point. I think they started using plastic internals. Um, oh, fun side anecdote about that. Um, but the magnet bypass doesn't work on a lot of these newer models. Um, and the side note is back in um, man, the Cold War era, so we had the same problem. Soviets would be coming up to uh, safes and they can put, um, put a x-ray up to it and like read the internals and they say, oh, all right, cool, like here's the dial number so you don't even have to crack it, you basically just read the code. And then the US got really smart, we're like, all right, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna make plastic wheels so you take up your x-ray machine, you're not gonna be able to get anything out of that. And Russia's like, oh, damn, that's that's funny trick, comrade. And so they come up and they, they just heat it, and so all the all the plates <laughs> melted inside. <laughs> um, so, earth magnets. Yeah, neodymium. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, earth magnets. Another another term for them. Um, but anything that has a large force. Uh, that one there, I think, was like 90 pounds or so. He said, but anywhere between 60 and 100. And the, the more, the better. Um, yeah, magnets are great, but they may narc on you. So this guy was outside of a bank, and I'm like, all right, great. Like, we'll come back and take this latch, and we're just going to walk in the back door later. Um, it didn't work. <laughs> so this, this guy just started screaming at us. Uh, fortunately, we were there after hours already. It was like 8 or 9 p.m. We're trying to secure an en uh, entry through the back door after, like, further after hours. 
Um, and this was in Spoke Compton, Washington, and like just so many fun stories about that. No, nobody said a word about it. Like this alarm's blaring, it's going off for five minutes, nobody shows up, and we bail and wait for a police, no response whatsoever. Um, but just something to be, be wary of. So this can bypass a lot of things, but there's also mechanisms inside where you can make this alarm and actually, actually trigger if it detect, detects another uh, magnetic field. Um, so various door uh, bypasses. Uh, so a lot of facilities, pretty much anybody can go up and walk in. Um, that's how I'm able to do it. Uh, but just like uh, in the virtual world, internal employees can be one of your biggest threats and it's worth enumerating your attack surface. So always enumerate before you go up to a building, do as much recon as you can, find out the systems in place, and then just test everything. Even if it looks one way, oftentimes it's another. Um, so you can go up and just find things like the key underneath the mat. I mean, kind of cliche, but good Lord, it happens everywhere. Um, and just other things like this. And then it's, it's an epidemic now, people putting codes with the push button locks, so I don't understand the point. Um, one of the most important things I want to teach you in this lock is the auxiliary deadlatch bolt, highlighted here in red. Um, so a lot of people don't understand how this works, but they know how the main latch works. And okay, the door closes, this is what keeps it shut. The latch pushes into the strike cavity, and then you can't pull it open because you physically have the main latch holding the door shut. What a lot of people don't realize is that the red piece, this auxiliary deadlatch bolt, um, aka the deadlatch, um, is not supposed to extend in that strike cavity. So this guy is supposed to depress against the strike plate. Um, this is an electric strike plate, so not, I mean, it still is very applicable, um, but less common than you'll see. Um, so this guy would rest here, and that depresses, and that's what holds this latch open and extended, much like a deadbolt. Um, if you have this also extended, you can just stick a tool back there and pull that latch back. So one tool that we use to do this fits inside your wallet. It's called the Sparrows Hall Pass. Really excellent tool. It just works um, any, anytime you see this vulnerability. So if you have an improperly fitted door, they're actually surprisingly hard to hang properly, and you will see this everywhere. Um, you can push the door closed or it ought to be closed. Um, you can always check for tolerances too. Like usually you'll know if you go up and the door wiggles a little bit, uh, that, that auxiliary latch is gonna be extended. If it's not, and you can see it's kind of close, you'll start getting an eye for, uh, for how far these are extended push on the door a little bit and then maybe he'll pop in. Also some of these still allow the latch to play a little bit so if there's a large gap in between there it may not even matter and it'll allow you to retract it a centimeter and that's all you need to open up the door. Uh, some other tools, Deviant loves this one, it's the Carolina Traveler. It is an excellent tool. Uh, Sparrows makes the Quick Gym and a couple different variations, uh, but just pretty much any piece of metal that has a little hook shape in there. You can even do that with gift cards, anything like that and it'll also open the lock. Um, so I want to show you something I came across recently, and these are two different vulnerabilities. Um, one, this is an inexperienced locksmith, or maybe just the employee of the store, um, retro, retro modified this lock. And you can see in here these spirals, this is where he drilled this out to extend this plate so the dead latch would extend into this, making it vulnerable and bypassable. Just didn't understand the function, thought both of those pens were supposed to extend into the strike cavity. So this guy out here was actually fitted properly, took a visual inspection of it, and I I could see, okay, it's, it's uh, retracted, so that, that one's gonna be dead latched in place, was not the case. The internals were failing on this. So right there, when that's depressed like that, you shouldn't be able to retract that latch. And just the internals are broken, so it's still worth going up and trying the bypass when we found out that worked on that door. So these are for doors that close away from you. You're always gonna have that beveled edge of the latch facing away, so when, when it closes naturally, that retracts and then pushes out. Um, if you do it the other way around, that it's the square back of it hits and the door never closes without pulling the handle. Um, so you always kinda know what, what direction they're gonna be facing based off how the door closes. So I did wanna show you, that's kinda what it looks like. That's a wonderful gap in between there, you might as well play. From looking at that, you can see, when, once you get the eye for it, you can see it's actually retracted there. But I think this was the vulnerable one that I just showed you in the vi uh, video prior. And again, we're testing, fully enumerate the service. Even if it looks one way, uh, it may not necessarily be so. So it was still worth uh, the bypass attack on that. Oh, all right. So if the door closes the other way, um, if it closes towards you, the latch is gonna be facing towards you. Plastic. It's the most hype video plastic I could find, and it's, it's great. going to go to town on this log. So
So this is the same vulnerability where you don't have line of sight. You got to work around the door jam a little bit. Door closes against you, so you push the lock that way because you know the latch is faced the other way. Um, a lot of tools you can source in the kitchen is honestly a great way. The kitchen and the garage is where you can find all these bypass tools uh, at home or abroad. So spatulas work great for that, the thin enough ones uh, that can work around and get you around the, the door jam there. Um, so one, one possible remediation you can incorporate to uh, try to prevent this bypass is to incorporate a latch guard. Basically the plate that just sit, sticks over this, you can't start manipulating that latch as easy. Um, you still always need to uh, remediate the underlying vulnerability. And if you see this, there may be a case that, okay, we couldn't uh, fit this door properly, we couldn't fit that strike plate and the latch together, um, but let's put the strike or the, uh, the latch guard on there. So it may be an indicator that this is still vulnerable. Um, they're honestly kind of a pain especially if you have a tolerance like the door on the right, that's, that's pretty tight, uh, it'd be hard to work in there. Door on the left, you can still definitely work in there. It's this one here, so that's, that's plenty of space. Um, so plenty of tools that can work inside there for you. Um, again, just home source, anything that's, that has a little bit of memory that retains its shape, you want something that curves. So guitar or piano wire works great. They do have commercial tools that are meant to slip around these. Uh, this sickle shaped thing here will only work on the smaller ones, um, but you can also use, um, what do they call that, a weed cutter line, weed whacker cord. Um, and that's great too because it's elastic, it, re it remembers its shape. Um, so you feed it down there and you want it to curve back to you. Um, you can also do this with another umber, uh, number of other things, but it's difficult if it doesn't curve and reach back to you. And that's where something like the Carolina Traveler can come into play, reach in the bottom and then pull the bottom part of this out and then start working from there. And that's actually uh, what a lot of the coal fire boys do. So if you work at coal fire, you're expected to improvise a little bit, go above and beyond. So this is Cat5 cable. <laughs> yeah, and that's the door open. So it looks like they just broke it in an elementary school here with a, with a post on the back. That's actually a bank, so a little, little bit higher value target, um, but a lot of places are vulnerable to that, so just something to check and look out for. Um, so you may have it figured out, you know, you're still thinking, all right, well, the door closes that way, closes that way. All right, so what, what if we have a door that closes away from you and it's around a bend like that, right? So a lot of these external doors, a lot of them don't even have handles. Um, this is what it may look like from the inside, obviously different doors, but just to explain. And then you'll have this, this latch that extends around the, the strike plate there. If you come across this situation, there are still things you can do using flexible cutting mats. So again, the kitchen. These are the super, super thin ones, almost like paper. Um, cut a little notch in there, just like you've done for your hall pass tools that you made out of credit cards, and then slip it over. It takes a lot of working, so you go above the latch typically um, and work down. And then once you start pulling it out and down, you can feel the notch slip around the latch. And then from there, pull while you're pushing the door, release the tension, again, right? Pretty common theme. And then pull that, and that's gonna slip that latch. So that actually was a su success attack on the image on the right um, for a bank out in Washington that we're able to extract a million dollars out of um, with further, further vulnerabilities. So pretty cool. So we had to give it back. Um, so remediation, uh, there are dead, uh, auxiliary dead latch bolts for these guys as well. Uh, hard to see, but it's right here on top and it's, it's depressed there. So that latch is secure, cannot be retracted without a lot of force. Um, so RFID, um, just one thing to check with these guys, there's, there's plenty of vulnerabilities, a lot of things you can do. Uh, one thing to look out for is if they fail open. Um, so a lot of security, you still have to, you know, preserving life is obviously a much greater um, concern than protecting data. So if this fails, power goes out the building, a lot of doors just unlock and open up. You can simulate that by popping off the cover, usually a screw in the bottom, and then just unplug the wires. Um, really cool if you carry alligator clips, you can do this attack at night, um, clip it and make it still good. And and then come up during the day, boom, pop it, take out the alligator clip, um, open up the door, and then put it back. And everything looks pretty kosher until you clean up at the end of the engagement. Um, oh, really cool attack for this too. So going after the, the Wigan protocol that, that most RFID uh, has as a backbone. Um, also vulnerable to replay attacks, which we're probably uh, familiar with from the virtual space. Oh no. He's got a timer, one minute, it's legit. Now you don't typically carry a power drill with you, but the Yankee screwdriver is really cool, like the screwdrivers that you push in and it rotates, uh, all mechanical. Those are great tools to keep as well. Oh, 
hard to see in the video, but he's just got three wires. He's got to punch down into the uh, the bleed key, which is this little module that some people have made to uh, perform relay attacks by sniffing the credentials as they come across the line, and then establishes a connection with your phone over Bluetooth. So in this case, you'd sit here, you'd have this installed at night, come back the next day after people have been badging in, you'll have plenty of badges stored on the bleed key. Five seconds. So there he just used an actual car and captured the credentials. Now he's coming back at night, whenever, hooking up to the bleed key, and then he's going to replay a card. Boom. Pretty slick. Um, there's a couple variations of those. This is probably one of the more modern ones that connects over your phone, but there's also uh, geckos and a couple other dumb devices that you'd have to go back and extract. Uh, maybe clone a card, which then does look very legit if you have to go to security afterwards um, or, or pass through any checkpoints like that. But variations on this attack where if you can get access to the reader uh, out of sight, um, have your way with it and then compromise the device. So thumb turn tools, I apologize for the terrible picture, but we're trying to demonstrate uh, double, double closing doors so you have the gap in the middle. Um, and then on some of these, you may have a thumb turn device. So from the inside, you have that thumb turn and it locks the door at the end of the night. Uh, and then from the outside, you have to have the key to get in there. But the way this tool works, it's a little hook um, and then at the end of it, you can spin one, one side and then there's little teeth on that side that you put around the, uh, the thumb turn and then it'll actuate that from the outside. The one tip I would have for you guys on this one is a lot of hooks, um, these are called hook latches, and these type of doors uh, will scoop out from underneath and then lat lat latch in. Uh, so with this guy, it was my first time ever using it on this bank, and we come up, I'm trying, I'm like, man, it's like, it's really going, but it's requiring a lot of force. Um, and I sat there for like two minutes like an idiot just trying to crank on it, almost broke my tool, until I realized it was turning it and the hook latch was uh, rubbing up against the metal of the tool. So then once I went over it and came back the other way, no problem, I opened right up. And then that's us again. Uh, Guy Gary I work with, he's the man, uh, just a beast of this kind of stuff. So a lot of the people that you'll meet in this industry, if you're able to break in, uh, just wonderful people. And by the way, if you are looking for a job, Coalfire is always hiring, so come talk to me after. Um, I want to talk to you about the K22. So this is probably the second most useful tool that I'll use besides a hall pass, um, which attaches the, attacks the latch. This one, you may come up against a door and things are looking pretty solid from the outside. Um, hinges can't be worked with. Uh, the lock's really, really sharp sharp, latches, totally secured, um, but you may still have tolerances above or below the door. Um, and with this, they make tools, so imagine the door from the outside, it's locked uh, in a stairwell, this is very common, but from inside, you can go up and then for ADA compliance, you have to have it uh, egress properly inside. So no authentication, you turn the handle and it's actually engaged and you release the door that way. So if you can reach up and grab that handle from the other side, from the unauthenticated side, reach towards the authenticated side, pull that handle and then that'll pop open the door. This works almost everywhere. It's it's so ubiquitous and it's a wonderful tool. Um, they do, like there's there's rumor floating around, they do have collapsible versions of this. A lot of people keep that close to the chest, uh, but you don't really need it. Uh, a lot of places you can walk in with this in a briefcase, uh, in the back of a backpack, or even in a garment bag. So very corporate uh, situation. You may be wearing a suit, come up with a garment bag, nobody suspects a thing, except the handle that you're holding onto is the handle of the K22. Um, one question that I get a lot of times on this is, how do you operate this? Like, which side's which? The side that has a little handle, that hook piece, that's where your hand goes. That's how you manipulate and work the tool. The other side connects to the wire that's going to slip around the handle, and you have the wire that you hold on the other side of the door. When you pull that, it bends the, bends the hook. So I'll show that here. So step one, you have a little bit of tolerance. Even here, you can't see any sunlight, and there was a rubber guard. You still had just enough to be able to slip the tool through. Push it all the way through, and then you start reaching the curved part of the tool. Flip this back, and at this point, you're on the other side of the door. You usually listen, wait for, and hear the, uh, the hook hit the door. So you have that metal on metal, and great. All right, I know right where this is. And you can start working with it and slide it over until you know you're on the handle. You'll feel it stop moving, so that's slider frame three there. And then from there, pull on the wire and grin like a jackal because you just broke in. 
Um, so if you come across a door like this, you can see the light coming through the other side, like you're golden, like your mouth should be drooling, like you know you're about to get in here. Um, if you don't come across that and you're just, you know, a couple millimeters too thin, you can use some air pump wedges um, or a crowbar and just work and get yourself that extra centimeter of space that you need. Um, so one of the best defenses against this is just having tight tolerances all across your door. You can retrofit uh, some of these doors and just tack on metal to the bottom, install a kick plate. Um, they make little clips that I'm starting to see now more in uh, hotels because almost every hotel is vulnerable to this and like three other ways to bypass and enter your room, which we should talk about someday. Um, um, but you'll see little clips. So it basically just makes the handle contiguous and there's no place for your tool to like slip behind the handle and reach in the door. So you ever see a little plastic clip on your handle in a hotel room, that's what that's for. It's preventing the under the door tool. Um, another remediation clients ask me about with this, well, what if we just install a, um, a handle, like a turn knob on this? Um, and one, there may be ADA compliance concerns, which I don't dive too deep into, that's for my clients, um, but they also make K22s that have a belt on the end. So you loop the belt over the handle and then it grips it and then if you pull the belt, it kind of works, works the knob that way. Okay, um, boroscopes are all, uh, also really useful. There's um, an app called CameraFi that you can just hook up any Android, any, any iPhone, uh, buy a $20 boroscope online. Super useful to slip, slip it underneath the door, find out, okay, I'm about to walk into a office full of employees. Is there a camera there? Like, is there other things like a box in the way that's slipping up my tools? Uh, so a great way to get a look on the other side of the other side of the door. Um, something else you can use if you have a ridiculous gap, um, take your phone out of the case. If you have that rear facing camera, stick it through the other side. You'll get half of the view on the bottom side and you can see what's on the other side there. What kind of handle it is, is usually what I'm looking for. Okay. So deadbolts are only deadbolted if they're fully extended. If a deadbolt doesn't fully extend, you can still just push it right in. So a lot of times you'll come across a strike cavity that isn't drilled far enough. If you have a one inch deadbolt, you need a one inch space for it to extend into. If it's only three quarters, it's not gonna, it's that last little bit that locks that in place and the mechanism dies inside so you can't retract that. Um, so if you come up to something, again, it's worth playing around with. Take your knife, take a Carolina Traveler and just see, can I start scraping this? Can I work it back a little bit? Um, and usually it opens up pretty quick. All right, very sophisticated tool, like almost everything we use. Pretty much my go-to go -to tools are tape, canned air, and coat hangers, and that'll get you in, and spatula or something. 95% of places, honestly. Um, so a lot of facilities lock down overnight, but during the day it may be a shared office space for multiple tenants. So you can walk through and you can access different parts of the facility, you may be able to get in the stairwell, um, but coming in from the other way and trying to ingress through the stairwell, that may be locked. So come through with your tape, tape the latch, keep that open, come back at, uh, overnight, open up the door because there's nothing holding that door in place. Um, very rarely does this ever get caught, like, um, and that's kind of the, the advantage of using innocuous tools like this. Uh, but once in a while, you could also put guards on alert, which gets a little bit more uh, hectic and dangerous. But this is a great book, uh, just covers some architecture, uh, design flaws, and like how people think about this. Like, if there's certain fire escapes, I know the elevator's here, um, and this suite's gonna be bigger, so maybe like, it was a burglar's guy to the city, so he's like, maybe this one contains like a lot of jewelry, it's the biggest suite, like in the thing you can tell by the fire escapes. Um, but the cover of it's really cool, just working around all the different angles, uh, and that's what it can feel like a lot of times if you're going through and taping latches. All right, this got me in a portion A, and I had to go into portion B, bypass this, and tape the next latch in there so a lot of times it can take iteration over your target um, and coming back and breaching different facilities or different spaces in the facility and then finding out what you have access to after then come back during the day tape that one and then work work through the facility like that um, this is, this is kind of like a quasi tool that I was making. Um, it's just got a dovetail piece, so you have your main main component here, and then little little layers that you can slice on top. So what I was doing, I had something universal that fits in a lot of strike plates. You can push that in, take it out, and then slide off the rest that you don't need, and completely fill up the uh, the strike plate so the latch doesn't extend. Uh, this is a little bit more conspicuous, but it's also really cool to be able to carry that. But tape is really kind of the way to go. Just playing around. Um, so again, enumerating the surface, this is my buddy Jim, great dude. Uh, you can see the RFID reader there on the right is red. Uh, typically means these guys are locked. Uh, locked. So again, just numerating your attack surface. Um, what happened in this case, the hydraulics in the door were just failing, it was old, hadn't been um, maintained, so the door didn't close hard enough. That latch didn't extend all the way. 
Uh, rec sensors. All right, cool. So rec sensors are request to exit sensors. Um, these are the little passive infrared motion sensors. They come in a wide variety. Typically, you only see the dumb version. Uh, what these guys are doing is just looking for uh, thermals. And a lot of them will know, OK, this is, this is my base reading. And if I see a temperature change from here, delta, positive or negative, not body heat, like I see something that's like 90 degrees open up. If you have a temperature change strong enough to trigger this, uh, it unlocks the, the mag locks up, up top, typically, uh, and the door will open up. So there's three vices that you can use that every day you know, we probably come across. And let's, let's explore. Supplied hacking by Sammy Kamkar, another cool dude in the industry, uh, worth, worth following. And today, we're going to learn how to open automatically locking doors from the outside using air dusters. So, I mean, freezing cold, like it should know, like that's not a human, but they're very cheap. Um, had to install them in a lot of places. So a lot of them dumb down or cheap out on the security appliances that you should be using. So some of the more advanced ones will recognize, is this a pet, is this a human based off its height off the floor? Sir. I put a warm cup of coffee under the door now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, pee in a cup, freeze it, slide underneath, wait for it to, yeah, absolutely, all sorts of stuff. That's how you can haze people too. Um, one, one thing that I want to show you there, let's see if we can get back to it. I do physical stuff, not, not computers. Yeah, I'll just let it play. Sorry, I know. Anyway. Hi, I'm Sammy. Hi, Sammy. And today, we're going to learn how to open automatically locking doors from the outside. Boom. What else do you guys see in the background? It's a door king system. And we know that even from a distance, you can see the big letters here, A, Z, and then the other button. Uh, only door king carries that. You know that's a 16120 key. See two keys up on there. They have um, the momentary switch for if somebody to come through with RFID card. So two keys, pop it open, hit that momentary switch. That door will fall open from that as well. OK, Dave Kennedy with Trusted Sec. Your second vice. A lot of us vape. <laughs> Boom. All right. So maybe you don't huff canned air, maybe you don't vape, but hopefully at least you drink. I think we did great on time, so we're going to have time for QA. Uh, last thing I just wanted to cover are Knox boxes, also key to like systems for uh, fire and law enforcement to come through, uh, typically fire. Um, but you'll see these almost outside every building. Uh, I'm not sure if it's code yet now. It may be. Back in the day, it was just for like shopkeepers um, that didn't want the fire department to bust down their doors if, they, if there was an incident. So they installed these on the outside. So the outside is key to like to the munici municipality. Typically, a uh, certain zip code may have a certain key for these, but inside contains the keys for that facility, right? So two different, two different um, uh, tenants in play here. Um, but if you can get the key for a municipality uh, or a zip code, you will have access to every facility inside that zip code that has uh, a Knox box installed outside. And with that, that's the end of my talk. So thank you guys so much for sitting in, and thank you. And then I will take some questions, so sir. Uh, the at Red Teams wins. Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Is it also W? Yeah, W-Y-N-N-S. Sorry, that's my last name, and so I doxed myself. Thank you. Thank you. Sir?